Uh, Professor Curio, uh -huh. how long have you been here in the country and uh, what sort of work are you doing here? Uh, I'm since nearly 19 years in the country and have erected um, NGO that is concerned largely with the maintenance of species, of endemic species that occur only in the Philippines or on a particular island in the Philippines. And uh, we, I, we, I was concerned with the maintenance of this species and we soon realized after one to two years that the population has to be brought behind us and not against us. Mm -hmm. So we uh, therefore embarked very soon on alternative livelihood measures, mm -hmm. on the uh, dissipation of knowledge through seminars and ITIs, okay. and uh, then uh, embarked on deforestation uh, uh, with native species, native species and not foreign species, that has been in vogue for many, many years here in the Philippines, uh, unfortunately, with mahogany and gemelina uh, to c tell the worst. And now it is a picture is changing that only native species are employed in afforestation. Uh, me? You? Yeah. Okay. So what have you discovered in the 19 years you're here? What can you say about the native species we have? Do you mean uh, about the species that we are protecting? Yes. Well, the um, main uh, species that we were protecting uh, were the two hornbill species that are endemic to Panay and Negros. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hornbill species are especially the Dulungan, is, uh, the, uh, the flagship species of Panay and of Antique in particular, uh, have been as a subject to our studies in terms of breeding biology, food ecology, and then the wardening of nests in the 70s and after the 30s in this century. Uh, the wardening of nests by uh, 220 people who were getting bounties for their fledging of nests mm -hmm. that they could uh, bring to fledging and that was a successful scheme uh, uh, and in which scheme in, uh, in the scheme in, in which scheme was successful in terms of the uh, fledged number of progeny of nestlings that were brought to maturity from their from these nests. These were, in the end, uh, 200, uh, uh, 270, 278, 80 uh, species that were uh, uh, covering an area of about half of the mountain range. Wow. So it, it seems that uh, beyond being just an uh, academic, uh, What's unique about what you've done here is you've actually participated in not only studying the environment, but actually uh, affecting its protection. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've learned a lot of uh, through your years, besides the scientific study of the environment, you've also learned a lot of techniques on how to engage the community in protecting yeah. the environment. And uh, secondly, it was, was of even more importance, was the law enforcement component of the project that we could employ seven, 18 forest rangers that we are going on foot patrol, unarmed, mm -hmm. and that should change in the near future. And they were ex established as VOs, of, uh, as environmental um, uh, wildlife officers wow. by the DNR, wow. by yeah. getting particular permits. And uh, that was a very successful scheme that went on for many years, including now with a reduced number of forest rangers. I come in a minute to say why it was yeah. reduced. Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, they confiscated uh, an enormous number of board feet 
of valuable heat timber, yeah. and secondly, of chainsaws. Wow. Okay. Uh, of yeah. nearly 50 chainsaws mm -hmm. were confiscated according to the f chainsaw law. <laughs> and this stipulates that a chainsaw can be uh, uh, obtained or arrested, so to speak, yeah. by any civilian if the number of the chainsaw, the uh, serial number of the chainsaw is tempered or erased. Okay. Yeah. That is pre stipulated in the chainsaw law. Mm -hmm. And these chainsaws are then deposited in the DNR offices closest to mm -hmm. us, like Kulasi or uh, Kalibo. And uh, apart from this, there has been little uh, change in terms of the arrested people because the DNR is very lenient to yeah. uh, uh, arrestment and uh, to the uh, forests uh, that are inhabited by the people. The, the best thing we can do is to uh, uh, um, confiscate the timber, lumber, the l lumber for uh, furniture yeah. and construction for, uh, for instance, in Boracay, yeah. and then to uh, arrest or confiscate the number of chainsaws. Yeah. I guess a very important question we were discussing before the camera went on is that uh, one of the things that we're curious about, why I'm personally asking the question, is the relationship about why protecting a national preserve like the Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park? Why is it important for the uh, survival of, uh, like, let's say, uh, national survival? Um, you were telling me that uh, people don't realize it, but by taking care of the natural park, you're actually assuring the uh, survival of, uh, of the country. If not, you know, you're helping out with the situation in global warming in the world. Maybe you could further yeah, discuss I mean, it. Uh, one has to realize that the Philippines are ranking, ranking first in the world in terms of their biodiversity, okay. namely as measured by the number of endemic species inhabited per square kilometer. Wow. I never it's that. Yeah. The, the number one per uh, biodiversity as measured in this way. So that is one reason why I am here and not being in Africa or in South, South America, America yeah. or the specific where I have worked. However, uh, I sh should work here uh, and I will work here until my lifetime is, is spelling. And uh, I think uh, there's no other country that deserves more attention than the Philippines. Okay. because of the enormous number of endemics here in this country. That's easily to be understood because the uh, species that are inhabiting the country are prone to speciation by being isolated on islands. Oh, and okay. since there, is, there are a number of 5,000 islands yeah. in the Philippines, it's understandable that species have fawn, formed primarily on these islands. Yes. <coughs> and therefore, they have formed subspecies as well that should be or should also maintain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and above all, the forest is, since these all of these species are forest dwellers, the maintenance of the forest has highest priority. Okay. And each tree that you remove from the forest is a criminal act. And therefore, we have to be very careful with the uh, confiscations and with the uh, uh, arrangement of the forest rangers. And we need to have much, much more forest rangers. Yeah. And we have only t t five on our payroll at the moment wow. because of the reduction of our annual budget. Okay. That has gone down by uh, enor enormously by in percentage-wise. Well, so um, in terms also, you were discussing about um, the, the, the uh, staggering uh, little percentage of forest cover left. 
you were saying that five percent in please uh, kindly elaborate on yeah. how much uh, what do you call this natural uh, uh, original forest coverage that we still have here here yeah. in in, oh, in, yes, in yes, yes. eight percent eight percent or negros only four uh, yeah. percent uh, and similar uh, numbers apply to other islands the largest islands like Minanao has 37 percent and on uh, Luzon there is uh, still a, a valid uh, number of species uh, surviving in 25 percent of the forest it's, but that, it's yeah. similar yeah. the relationship is similar to uh, on all islands nearly except for Palawan that has still the biggest and best service is the best forest, namely some uh, eighty-five percent wow. of the forest okay. is left. Um, is there a critical line wherein, like, say, uh, at this certain percentage, it's still possible for the for the forest coverage to grow again, uh, or there's a line wherein if once you reach the certain critical percentage, then there's nothing you can do? No, the critical line yeah. of the forest that becomes reduced due to human impact is already starting at uh, point zero. The okay. critical line That's is cool. already starting at point zero. So if you remove 5% of the forest and 90% are left, there is certainly a reduction in species numbers wow. of those forest dwellers that need the forest. Wow. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, uh, I'd like to add also the reason why it's very important. I remember uh, during the time of my grandparents, during World War II, although you're not an environmentalist, during the war, uh, people went to the forest because it's a food bank. Uh, but that was during the time World War II. I think we had 60% overall forest coverage all over the Philippines. Now we're talking about something like... 20... Uh, 17% are 70%. left in the, in the whole of the Philippines. In the whole of the Philippines. And uh, some islands have com become completely denuded. Okay, it's, you were saying that reforestation does not really answer the, uh, the what do you call this, mitigating uh, the loss of uh, the animal. Why is that? It is an attempt to stem this enormous demise of the species. It's an attempt. To, and we believe mm -hmm. that, only believe, that some of the species can be rescued by a rescue effect of remaining forests and what we make out of them, okay. namely reforest them, mm -hmm. and then have a forest cover of, let's say, 40% or so, but of growing forests mm -hmm. that is still in its first successional stage, as it is called, okay. technically. Okay, that's For good. Forests yeah. uh, are still in the very first stages and until the climax uh, stage is reached mm -hmm. after 500 years, so many years have wow. to be spent and in this time most of the species will have died out. Namely the forest species, forest species who are dependent on seed dispersal, mm -hmm. it's a very important aspect, of animals who are doing seed dispersal and <clears throat> of animals that live on the forest directly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is, it, is it also, is there a correlation between a, the uh, survival of like, let's say, uh, population survival in terms of like, let's say, a major impact event like, uh, you, you know, all this global warming, these disasters and it, it heightens uh, geopolitical stressors and in terms of war. Is there a uh, effect in terms of the decreased uh, food bank or what do you call this? Um, that uh, biodiversity of species and the survival of the uh, population in its it, environment. It is only speeding up the demise of the species. Including it us. It is speeding us. Yes. Yeah, including us, yes. Okay, you, that's of it. course. But is this uh, species that are surviving are reduced in numbers mm -hmm. through global warming. Okay. If they have no chance to, a chance to evade the area, evacuate the area yeah. and go northerly or southerly into these directions. But this is uh, uh, 
um, um, hypothesis that is certainly minimal in its impact because the Philippines have no chance to survive in uh, northerly areas. Wow. You cannot survive or transplant a species to southern China, yeah. for instance. Yeah. They are not adapted to this yeah. climate. So knowing all these things, what's possible? I mean, what have other countries done? What are the things that we can do in this country to help stem these challenges? Just re to reforest, mm -hmm. to diminish or even extinguish hunting okay. for the pot yes. and for play. As we found out, 80% of the hunting is done for fun. In the Philippines, you must realize here. People then say, oh, you, you, you must realize that the poverty is so big that the people have to shoot a dulungan. No, it is done for fun, as our questionnaires uh, 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 have brought out. And secondly, afforestation is one item. Thirdly, the erection of research stations is one possible item because it has been so shown that by an investigation of 47 parks in worldwide, the presence of a research station is minimizing the impact from the population. Yes. Funnily, but it is in a, in a way some respect there yeah. and shows the people that has to be uh, that, that there has to be a respect for the living creatures of the ecosystem. And although these paper parks, mm -hmm. as I call them, are purely staffed uh, and have no forest rangers sometimes, are res respected still in some respect and therefore contribute to the maintenance of the whole of the ecoforests. And then ecotourism is a possibility, but here it is a political uh, um, uh, obstacle that uh, goes against it. Because the people who are thriving most from it, namely the concessionaires and the people running the ecosystem uh, nature reserve, as I call it, yes. <coughs> They do little or nothing at all in order to have the money trickle down to the poor population who provides the uh, input for the uh, population to be maintained in the restaurants, in the cottages, and so on and so on. So that, for instance, in Zulavesi, a whole park have, has broken down, although it was funded with enormous enthusiasm in the beginning because of the people didn't get any reward from the tourism that they had made possible. So that's a positive thing, no? So we, what you're saying, in effect, although there are failed models, there is actually a model that we can follow for ecotourism. We yeah. just have to make sure that the funding mechanism trickles down yeah, to the exactly. action. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then it, the environment can pay for itself. That, yeah. Is there a uh, best practice uh, part that we can research on so that we can pattern, uh, like let's say if you were to help um, um, uh, areas like this or in where we stay in, uh, in the Sierra Madre area, where we can, help, uh, we can help the communities there actually protect uh, is there a model where we can follow? I fear not oh. in the Philippines. How about abroad? There are uh, very good parks that are well managed, mm -hmm. well organized, namely in uh, Africa, a number of parks, mm -hmm. in South America, but not so much in the Southwest Pacific that I have personally become acquainted with and not so much in Southeast Asia, although there are attempts of restoring nature in the uh, Sumatra and Borneo. 
in Java, but here again, the ecologic, the economic interests are against our Spanish st stemming the tide, yeah. namely the oil plantations that are covering thousands of square kilometers now in Sumatra and Borneo. Yeah. That's a, a very it's sad a fact. Yeah. That the World Bank is still supporting this uh, event, that so several European countries are supporting via the World Bank these oil plantations that are a demise for the species. They have only a oil plants of thousands of kilometers without any undergrowth, without any overgrowth, yeah. nothing else. I think what the public should also understand is that <laughs> mono, monoculture or monocropping, yeah. even, even if it's like, if you see a forest, sometimes it's, it's a, a I don't know the technical term. It's a false forest. It's not a real forest. Eh? Yeah. That eventually it will, you know, it will catch up on us as a species. Eh? Yeah. Is, is it correct that uh, our very survival as uh, human beings is dependent upon the diversity of? Uh, yeah, I, th I think so, because as we multiply, uh, multiply in numbers, uh, human survival is very much in question. As we multiply in numbers, it's, it's especially prevalent for the Philippines. We have now over 110 million people here. That was two, 20 years ago when I started here, only 90 million. But now it's over 120 people, 109, 129, million. 129 people. Million. Uh, yeah. And this will undoubtedly uh, lead to famine, the poverty, the rice can no longer be grown in the country itself, but must be exported, it must be imported, and uh, this import of rice is now even threatened. First, Thailand has closed down the rice export, and Vietnam is practically the only source of our rice for the Philippines, and I think the Vietnamese population will also grow, of yeah. course. Yeah. Of, of course. course, they are not inhibit yeah. inhabited to grow, yeah. and therefore they will close down as well. Mm -hmm. And then I predict there will be an enormous famine here in the country. If in case that an enormous famine happens here, will this natural park be the last bastions for survival? Or will they also? The, I mean, then I think yeah. the, all the parks are crumbling and are uh, no longer maintained in its in their integrity because the people are just yeah. roaming over the forest, cutting what they can cut, cutting all, getting all the honey from the honeybee, yeah. the wild honeybees, and so on, and so on. There's, uh, there's no halt to the human species. Anyway, thank you for uh, no, for giving us the time. Now we know more about the importance of the uh, Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park. And uh, from what we gathered interviewing the forest rangers, the people in the community, and Professor Curio, it's very critical that we take care of the forest. Uh, and it will take some time, although we, we understand uh, the concept of uh, ecotourism and natural park, I think we will just re really need to do some further studies on to see on how, uh, how best we could help uh, preserve this because by preserving the natural part, essentially we're preserving the future for children. And um, hopefully we, uh, there's a silver lining behind this, <laughs> like a Hollywood movie where you see uh, it's impossible but we're actually able to achieve it. The most important thing is to get the right information and we're doing that right now. Thank yeah. you very much, Professor. And I hope uh, we could help each other. Thank you very much.